All right, welcome back. It is um, just before 2 p.m. on Wednesday, February 3rd. And we are having uh, a meeting this afternoon for about an hour to talk about the, um, continuing the conversation that we've had for some time on the effects of using hotels or motels for um, mitigating the homelessness after the pandemic started. We, we were able to get quite a few people off the streets, many more than we thought existed, um, and put them into um, hotels and motels across the state. And one of the, and that was done as a public safety and a public health gesture, um, simply because we felt like they, um, people who were experiencing homelessness were, I believe the term that was coined last year was um, hyper vulnerable and and yet at the same time, we've created um, subcultures in some of these neighborhoods now in, of hotels that are real life issues that um, I think we need to discuss and, and just know uh, have occurred. And so I'm just curious to get a point of view from that. There was an article in the Times Argus, a very Montpelier Times Argus last week that um, talked about some of the issues here in central Vermont, um, but they're human issues. And I just wanted to lay them out there and have the committee hear what's been going on. And so with us today is our Tim Bombardier from Barry City, Director of Public Safety. And we have Tricia Tayo, uh, who's now the Deputy Commissioner in Economic Services Division um, at DCF, along with Jeffrey Pippinger. And then we have Rick DeAngelis and Barbara Jenny from the Good Samaritan Haven in Barry, which is, um, which is a shelter, a homeless shelter um, in downtown Barry City. And Good Sam also was, and I'm not sure, and we'll get an update from Rick on, um, on the status of that, but they were also the de facto leads on um, utilizing the Econo Lodge in Montpelier and perhaps the Hilltop in, in Berlin as well. So with that, uh, I'll start off, we have um, Chief Bombardier to come up first. And um, Chief, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invite, too. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to people. Um, I'm going to warn everybody, I'm going to start out with the bad stuff first, because I think that the bad stuff needs to be brought to people's attention. Um, but it's not all bad, and I think we're going to hear from others that it's not all bad and we have some great opportunities here. Um, you called the hotels a community or a neighborhood to start with. And I think that's a good way of looking at what's been created uh, by moving people into these hotels. In, in the beginning, this started out uh, from all accounts as really a short-term solution to the COVID pandemic and addressing how we were gonna keep people safe. Um, it's now been 11 months and I've talked to people about long-term plans. And as of today's date, I'm not aware of a long-term plan in place of what's gonna happen when this funding dries up. I have some serious concerns about these hotels. And if tomorrow, if everybody was just told they don't have a place to stay, what type of impact that would have on our service providers. And when I use the term service providers, I'm not just talking about police firing EMS. I'm talking about folks from the Good Sam, folks from Capstone, our Justice Center, um, our judicial system. Um, unfortunately, there's a more immediate need at the hotels and in our communities. The reports of criminal activity taking place in, around, in and around these hotels is not acceptable. And neither is the activity that's spilling over into other areas of our community. These issues range from minor things like noise complaints and welfare checks to drug sales, overdoses, assaults, prostitution, domestic violence cases, and the list goes on. Um, we also have a missing person case from one of the hotels from back in April of last year, which is probably gonna turn out to be a homicide and I have had detectives working on it since April of last year. Um, it's fair to say that this type of criminal conduct adversely affects the good individuals who for no other reason than not having a home or stay, also staying in the same hotel. 
Um, everyone deserves to enjoy the same peace and tranquility that we all expect when we go home. And just because you're homeless, um, that should not be taken away from you. Um, we've been told that some of the folks staying in the hotels are afraid to leave their rooms or report incidents to hotel staff or the police. Early on, um, this hampered attempts to get people involved with services. And through the hard work of some of our other service providers, I know that uh, Mary from Washington County Mental Health spoke this morning, or at least she was going. Um, they've done some great outreach in trying to engage people in need, um, but it hasn't been easy. Some of these people are still living in fear and prior attempts to involve both the security, um, private security and the sheriff's office have made an impact, but it's really not enough. Um, so you have an, an idea of the magnitude of the problem in central Vermont, um, and I've been told by other chiefs that they are having similar issues. I've compiled information regarding the seven hotels here, the activity and the activity around them from the 1st of March of 2020. And um, I started this back on January 7th, compiling the information. So it's gonna jump around a little bit, but I first looked at what was going on in Barry the involvement in the hotels, and more importantly, the people um, who were using the hotels as their addresses that had involvements with law enforcement or fire slash EMS. Um, in Barrie, that number was 14 people that were using the Hollow Inn, and that's just the Hollow Inn as a resident. Those 14 people had 33 involvements. Um, at the Hollow Inn address, but they had chalked up 130, 139 involvements in and around our community. So 33 at, uh, at where they're living, but another 106 um, out and about in the community. When I say community, I mean all of central Vermont, um, Montpelier, Berry City, Berry Town, and Berlin all uh, share the same record management system. So I'm able to look at their cases and I have permission from the chiefs to share that in with you. The complaints from just the folks from the hollow range from, again, drugs, but also the serious things uh, in addition to drugs, arrests on outstanding warrants, domestic violence cases, and that, as I mentioned, the one missing person here. I also looked at the people who had involvement from the hilltop in Berlin. There were 68 people in Berlin during that same time frame who had involvement. When we looked at the O'Connell Lodge, there were 20 people at the O'Connell Lodge. Initially, I didn't take the time to go down through and um, count because I have to go back. It's not just a couple of clicks. I have to physically count from the start date their individual involvements. Um, I've since figured out how to do it differently. But I, I was thinking that um, Berlin, was, Berlin and Montpelier were similar to us with regards and probably that Berlin at the hilltop was worse. I was looking to see how many of these people actually came from central Vermont and had involvement with us and other service providers first. And my initial look showed that it was about 35 percent of those individuals weren't from here. Uh, and when I say individuals weren't from here, I mean the ones that had police involvement, not the whole group of people staying in the hotel. That was the first day I looked at it. The next day I dug a little deeper into the other two hotels, being the O'Connell Lodge and the Hilltop. A quick snapshot of what has been going on at the O'Connell Lodge, there were 20 individuals who used the O'Connell Lodge as their residence when being involved with the police during the same time frame? They had a total of 359 involvements with law enforcement or police slash or fire slash EMS. Um, of those, 226 of them had not taken place at the hotel. They had taken place in other areas of Central Vermont. Um, there's an overlap with these sometimes. Two people will be involved in the same uh, case. 
but still, even considering the overlap, these numbers are, are really high. Then I went to yesterday just to get a quick look at where we are now, and it's been a week. Um, yesterday, there were 254 adults staying in the seven hotels in central Vermont, 62 children in addition to these adults. Um, 138 of these adults have been involved with the police or fire and EMS or both. And they've been involved in 937 calls for service. This is a very broad overview. And as I said, there's definitely overlaps of people and incidents. But of those 138 adults, 53 of them have been arrested. Um, the majority of them are from the hilltop. But the Econo Lodge, the Hollow Inn, the Quality Inn, we added the Quality Inn when, when we started to dig a little deeper and um, contributed individuals from those areas contributed to those 53 people being arrested. Um, and the number of those that uh, don't appear to be from central Vermont when I look at the big group is roughly 20%. And I know I've talked a lot about the bad things to make my point that things are not good and that they need to change and we need a plan for the future. Um, we, law enforcement, people in this building, whether it's dispatch, my officers, my social worker, or our mental health clinician, all understand that the homeless population will often demand more of our resources, or that in some cases past legal or mental health or substance abuse issues have led to homelessness in the first place. Uh, law enforcement and service providers are doing the best they can to take care of the needs of this population, especially those living in fear of the other hotel guests and those with children. Um, dealing with the children, initially the children were spaced out in all of these hotels. And quite frankly, there's a couple of hotels that children should never be in. Um, that was dealt with early on by ABC Human Services and Rob Evans, who is working with them to get the majority of the children to a safer place being the hollow end that isn't on a main drag and kind of more child friendly with actual grass and a backyard, et cetera. But beyond the, the calls for service for fights and public disorder, as I mentioned before, there's greater challenges um, and they're hidden behind the hotel doors. They're hidden in the hallway. They're done undercover darkness. And those are the drug abuse and drug dealing, the domestic abuse and domestic violence cases. Uh, we even have reports of human trafficking taking place at one of the hotels. And life and calls for service still go on in our communities outside of these hotels. And while the emergent calls for service are being addressed, we're hard pressed to tackle these greater challenges working behind the closed doors and just down the hall. Uh, we're hoping to address some of these issues um, with enhanced enforcement and also enhanced outreach involving not only our officers, but as I mentioned before, we have police social worker, we have a mental health clinician, and we have a good community partners here in central Vermont. In Washington County, we've begun our preliminary discussion on planning and how to ensure this successful handoff and case management and services with the various housing individuals when this system sunsets. Um, I've heard recently as soon as October. Um, planning's gotta begin now to ensure that those here temporarily have a plan when they return to their home communities. And I focused on, as I said in the beginning, some of the bad things to make the point that things aren't good, but there's also a great opportunity here. And having so many members of this vulnerable population in more or less all in one place, there's an opportunity to get these people the help they need and work on a long-term plan for housing, stability and treatment needs and a better life. And I don't think there's anybody here that would say they don't believe everyone deserves that. And I believe everyone deserves that. We need to make that happen. Thank you.
Thank you, Tim. Um, Representative Walls. Thank you, Chief, and thanks to, to the force uh, for all the work you've done. I, the numbers are staggering, and thank you for having those numbers for us. I've got several questions. I'm assuming that many of these people had previous experience with law enforcement before the uh, placement in motels. Do you have a do you have an idea of the scope of that? So let me just pull up a spreadsheet I have here. Excuse hmm. me a second. Because I'm assuming these aren't issues that popped up just because they're all in motels. So no, it, it I it's fair to say that it's compounded because they're all in motels. And I unfortunately my system, when I look at stuff, I'm only dealing with the people that have had law enforcement. Um mm -hmm involvement, but I'm just pulling up my spreadsheet on arrest history here. So I can I can speak of the people arrested. And let me just well I don't need a hard number chief. I mean oh no of, of most of the people arrested those individuals have had prior law enforcement. I, I have hard numbers if somebody ever needs them. Most of those people have had um, prior law enforcement involvement. And that's one of the things that I don't think worked in the beginning, and I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't mention it. Um, this was done very quickly with no vetting with mm -hmm. uh, local authorities. And don't get me wrong, by vetting, I'm not saying just because of somebody's past, we don't give them a place to stay. But I'm, I'm saying when we vet people, and we're looking at placing families with children in places with other people who have known involvement with law enforcement in history. You make some different decisions on who goes where, not just there's an empty room at this hotel. So that is something, um, if I could draw a line in the sand that I would start today, and we discuss that amongst our group of what that would look like. Um, so. Okay, well, I have two more questions. You just partially answered a third one I had. Uh, you're just tying in with that. Uh, I think you just said there probably should have been more conversation and coordination going on at the very beginning uh, that probably could have headed off some of this if the, if the appropriate services had been there right from the very beginning and you know, people had been alerted to what potentially they were facing. That, as a service providers. Uh, and I think, I think you pretty much answered that. Uh, but I've got a couple more questions. One is, I'm, I'm just wondering now, all uh, the expense of this now, is the expense being borne uh, by the local police department and therefore the municipality? So up until now, the answer was yes. Um, recently, I had a conversation with Commissioner Brown, and they are providing 20 hours of enhanced police services that we're going to share between four departments. Um, even though Barry Town does not have um, hotels in their community, mm -hmm. uh, Chief Dodge is intelligent enough to realize that some of this stuff is spilling over into his, his town as well. And we're kind of modeling our enhanced approach um, from a law enforcement perspective, like we would do with a problem neighborhood or a problem house here in the state, city involving uniformed people, our street crimes unit and detectives from the four communities. Um, also, we're involving our community outreach specialist or police social worker and our mental health clinician so that when we find somebody in need, that it's not just an enforcement action, it's complete services. And we're, and we're looking at people as individuals and regardless of if you've done something wrong, um, you might still need help. We're trying to make sure we provide that for you. Well, I, I think you're very good at answering questions before I ask them. And I think <laughs> you just partially answered my, my last question there was, uh, the role you see law enforcement has if we, as we transition these folks out of the motels, hopefully we can give them 
more stable, more secure housing. Do you see a role in law enforcement and in making that happen? I I see a role in law, with law enforcement in in helping people in general. I mean, it's not uncommon. We have a lot of proactive things for helping people, even when we arrest them. Um, <laughs> folks that know me know that since I've been here, I've been an advocate of a police social worker. Um, advocated for a mental health clinician for a decade before we finally got one. So this isn't just about enforcement and punishment. This is a well-rounded approach to dealing with people, good and bad situations, and getting people the help they need. All right. Thank you very much, Chief. You're welcome. Okay, Representative Kalaki, then Hango. Thank you, Chief. Um, and... and if, if it's possible to send your aggregate numbers, I would like to have them just, or for the committee, if you'd send it to Ron, it would be great for us to understand that, you know, as it added up, as you were talking about it. Um, because in the pandemic, we're in a no eviction moment, mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming that one of the problems is that if someone is threatened to someone, you can't kick them out of the hotel. They still have to be housed. Is is that correct? And is that part of an issue? Well, or can you so move if, them? If, if someone, they could be removed from that hotel and maybe swapped out for somebody in another hotel. Okay. Um, the problem with with the hotels um, is there's not a lot of incentive to have people follow the rules, particularly with a no eviction thing. Um, they're supposed to be a free strike. And I think Rick may be able to talk about this also. A three strike rule, you're out. But um, where do you go? Do you go on the street? That's not helping our situation um, in the communities. And it's not helping that individual's situation. Yes. All right, thank you. OK, Representative Hango, and then we'll move along to um, to Tricia and Jeffrey. Yes, thank you. I want to thank you for bringing up and highlighting the um, incidences of uh, less than desirable behavior that might be happening um, as a result of putting many people together of different backgrounds and um, in, in one very small place. Um, I know that even though we've done really work in, in helping to house so many people who were formerly homeless, this isn't always a seamless transition. And I really appreciate your thoughtful thinking ahead of what can be done in the future and what can be done when we're moving people out of hotels and back into um, their own homes or new homes. Um, I know uh, we had a, a, an occurrence in one of my towns that I had to mediate um, between the Department of Children and Families. And I really appreciate that um, Deputy Commissioner Tayo in her former role was very helpful um, between DCF and the um, legislative body of the town that there was a misunderstanding of actually who was housed in those hotels. So I think it's really important to have a conversation between law enforcement and the Agency of Human Services and people who actually live in those towns to facilitate an understanding of who is there, why they're there, what's being done about it. And I, I truly appreciate that you're here telling us the not so pretty details, um, but actually also offering some assistance and solutions for the future. So this maybe wouldn't happen again in another time. So thank you. I'm, I'm really hoping that everybody learns from this. If I were to go back and do one thing over um, that I think would have helped from the start. It is that conversation and that involvement with local authorities and local service providers within the community. I don't get caught flat-footed very often. 
when I came in on Monday. I think I talked to Rick that day. I got caught flat-footed, and at the time, um, I made a call to the deputy secretary, who was Carrie Sleeper at the time, and I was not a happy camper, um, like a lot of people in the community were. And if that could ever be avoided in the future, that's one of the number one things that needs to be avoided: is catching people flat-footed with no idea of what's going on. Well, I think we can say we were all in that boat a year ago, um, and it was uh, not unlike we deal with when, well, it's quite unlike anything we've ever dealt with, period. But the idea that um, the idea that's something that this series could be happening and happening as quickly as it was, I mean, a year ago, on the Wednesday before we were done in the State House, we were still trying to figure out how we were going to get things across the line for crossover day and then by you know within 24 hours we were starting to consider what it was going to be like uh having to do legislation in 24 hours before we left the building for uh, i don't know 10 and a half months now so um and then having to figure this out so i think i i as flat-footed as you may have been caught chief um i you know we appreciate that everyone really put on their typical Vermonter hat and said, what are we going to, what's the next right thing to do? And one of the first right things was to get people off the streets. And then we're going to hopefully look at this and, and yes, maybe next time we'll have a protocol and hopefully the next time isn't for another hundred years. Um, so thank you for your, please, to, please stick around. I think if we'll probably have some, some roundup questions later, but um Trisha and Jeffrey, welcome. The microphone is yours. Um, and just, I'd like to just get, I know that Trisha, you provided some information, some updated information and that you might want to share. And um, again, welcome. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate that. And I, I'm going to try to share my screen. So you tell me if you can see it okay here in a minute. All right. There you go. There we go. All right. Um, so just nine slides. This won't take uh, take long. So um, let me start with a little bit of a timeline. So the security and the services in motels has evolved over time. It's really part of the larger strategy of support and services that we we put in place to address the non congregate sheltering of people experiencing homelessness. So. You know, we really, when the pand pandemic began, the first thing that we did was um, some shelters could not remain open because of um, they were congregate shelters and they could not meet the public health uh, needs of those of the people living there. So they had to um, close down. So that was the first thing that happened. And we moved people out of um, certain shelters and Good Samaritan um, was one of them that wholesale went into hotels. So these, um, the people that moved were people from the, the communities. Um, so from, in, in this instance, Central Vermont's community that went to the Econo Lodge. Um, it was after we realized um, the need for this, you know, the duration of the situation and the continued waving of rules and more and more people that things started, we realized we needed to start putting more services in place um, and security. So this is where the timeline starts. So um, between March and June really was the end of the normal HOP um, housing opportunity program grants through OEO. That was the normal end of those services. So the shelters um, that we're talking about and the housing agencies all had those grants in place. So there were supplemental phase one grants issued to assist them to quickly um, try to gear up for um, PPE and different things to um, for if they could remain open, but also to shift people to the hotels and assist with on-site services from those partners. And I, I'm sure Rick and Barbara can speak more about that soon. 
So those phase one awards happened between then. Um, April In April, um, we contracted with Rob Evans, who was um, for CERT security coordination. He's a former Vermont State Trooper and the chief spoke about him um, at the time. We also began in April the mass feeding project for uh, Vermonters experiencing homelessness that were in um, the hotels. And in June, the already existing sheriff's contracts expanded to start roving patrols in many of the hotels, most of them at that point in Chittenden County because of the volume of need there. So those were Lamoille County Sheriff's, Caledonia County Sheriff's. Um, there were a few um, Bennington County and several others that I'll talk about soon. Um, then in July, uh, well, the end of June and July, another round of supplemental awards were issued through OEO to service providers to provide more supports to the hotels, um, realizing how long this was going on. Then in November, we started a private contract with Colchester PD for two of the hotels in Colchester um, after hearing about some incidences involving St. Mike's College and some other problems in that area. Um, Representative Hango talked about some concerns in the Richmond community. So yes, we, we were um, at that point talking about what the needs were there with small communities. It really has had um, a big impact um, when people started moving to hotels in that area. Um, December, we started a um, private security contract with Green Mountain Concert Services. So that was for 11 hotels, three of them in the central Vermont area. So Chief spoke of that as well. So those services were from um, seven days a week from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. So um, it's hard to tell how much that presence may have helped um, to deter some things, but um, you, you know, private security isn't law enforcement as well. So sometimes the, there is a need for something different, but that was um, a help at the time. And then um, December, uh, we issued a, yet another round of awards to 14 entities for, these are called non-congregate shelter service contracts. So this was $2.9 million. And this was specifically FEMA funded. And this is not for case management type services or counseling. This was specifically for um, the safety and security at hotels for providers to be on site and um, provide additional supports. So again, um, this is introducing uh, Rob Evans who helped um, with our security contracts and also the community outreach with local law enforcement agencies. He's been instrumental in really working with the different departments to be a liaison. Um, things were happening very fast in the beginning of this as uh, Representative Stevens said, we um, were all moving as quick as our feet would allow to get things in place. So um, Rob was very helpful in you know, working with hotel owners even to remind them um, at, at the beginning, as you remember, hotels were closed to the public for the most part. So we were the only customers in some places of theirs. So we were reminding them of um, their responsibility and ability to not house people for violating hotel rules of disturbing others and criminal acts so that they, they could remove people from their hotels. A lot of times we would hear about things after the fact that had been going on and festering in the hotels. Um, our staff also provided outreach and support um, for local housing and shelter providers to facilitate information sharing um, so that we could problem solve. Um, and to date, the contracts for those security um, the security with the sheriffs alone was, is $1.1 million. And then we have additional invoices we're expecting from Green Mountain Concert Services and Colchester PD that have not arrived yet. So just a piece of what it costs. 
So this is the um, supplemental awards that were issued considered phase two through OEO, um, July 2020 through December. This was CRF money, if people remember, um, this was that additional push. So these are some of the award amounts and the agencies that received those awards. And it was a total between phase one and phase two of 5.2 million. So for Central Vermont, Capstone is listed there. Um, and then that, that was the total for the entire state. So then we move to, these are the, the awards that were just issued in December. Um, so non-congregate shelter service contracts do not support the case management or mental health or housing services. Um, these are the ones that were that are FEMA eligible. So these are the current ones that are in place before additional assistance. This is a visual, a graph of the entire GA motel utilization since the beginning. Um, it's been, people have wanted to see, it's a pretty powerful um, graph right today, we are at um, 890, 1,890 hotel rooms. Um, so these are just the hotel rooms. And this chart does not include the Holiday Inn, which is a very large hotel in Chittenden County. I think we have 123 people there. So um, just over 100 hotel rooms. But you can see how quickly it escalated in March, April, and May um, and got to almost a peak. And then some, the, the dip that you see through the summer, some of the rules that were put in place for the GA program um, around different things like the period of ineligibility. So if people are removed from a hotel um, for a rule violation or criminal activity or things like that, they receive a notice to vacate and they're put on a period of ineligibility for either 15 or 30 days at the moment. So they're ineligible for further services. So it was really important to work with the hotels to make sure that they issued the notice to vacate so that, um, because of course people have due process rights um, and rights to fair hearings if they feel like we made a wrong call about um, having them exit a hotel. There were also self-pay requirements in place through the summer, and then those restrictions were lifted when during the cold weather, uh, once things started in November. So you can see we start to um, climb again. So self-pay rules are really um, people who have income um, or resources must um, pay a portion of their hotel nights before we would pay for them again. It's 30% of a certain amount. And this is the GA motel summary as of yesterday. So this is the number of people. Um, you can see the number of rooms in Holiday Inn. It was 124, sorry. Um, so this will show you each district and the number of adults and children that are housed. And then last is the mat. This is just a dashboard that we put together for the mass feeding project, which has been an, an enormous help, of course in um, allowing people to not have to um, during, you know, when the, the numbers were very high for public health emergency, they, uh, the food was really, it was brought to them in their rooms. So um, as of now, $5.2 million has been spent on the mass feeding project. And that's what I have for us. All right, any questions? Representative Kablaki. Representative Stevens, I don't know if you want me to go first before questions. I just have a few other Oh, no, sure. Go ahead, Jeffrey. That would be great. Um, so thank you, thank you, Tricia. Um, I just had a few things that I wanted to, to touch on really quickly. Um, uh, number one is that something that we, that we don't often mention was that back in April, um, which seems like a lifetime ago, um, we had reached out to our colleagues at the Departments of Corrections uh, in the restorative justice arena 
And we engage the CJCs, the community justice centers around the state in kind of an ad hoc manner to try and bring folks together to see whether or not there were other alternatives uh, to addressing various challenges in the motels and with clients, um, uh, using a restorative justice process uh, and whether or not there was a place for that uh, in the, the setting, the newly created settings uh, as a result of the pandemic. And I do think that um, that were, those were really interesting conversations um, about the ways in which there might be opportunities to engage uh, clients and engage motel owners and staff in a different way rather than calling law enforcement if needed um, or, if it, or if not needed in that case. Uh, so there were different, there were, there were efforts at, of uh, varying sorts and to varying degrees around the state at that time, around those community justice centers. Um, I would be happy if the committee wanted to get more information from uh, Derek Mia Dubnik over in Corrections about uh, what sorts of long-term uh, impacts or effects that might have had. Um, and for the record, I'm sorry, my name is Jeffrey Peppinger. I'm the Senior Advisor to the Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. So that was the first point I wanted to make is that there, were, there have been some attempts and some ongoing uh, efforts locally that involve other alternative means of resolving conflict. Uh, number two is that I think something that I, I continually try to remind myself of and to remind others of is that you know, we, we really have, I mean, the, 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 the amount of ambiguity that we're dealing with in terms of the pandemic is really just it's something that's hard to wrap your head around. And to the question of short versus long-term, back in March, I don't think any of us would have known that here we are 11 months later and the pandemic isn't over. So whether it's short or long-term, it's, it's what we're having to do now to deal with an ongoing public health crisis. You know, I think many folks are, um, we're tired, right? Uh, people are tired and they're tired of the pandemic. And yet we still have to continue to respond and we still have to continue to stay you know, responsive to the ways in which that affects folks in our communities and folks in need of services. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned that, you know, not just to frame the fact that the pandemic of course is still going on right now. There are still challenges in that arena, but also um, to note that that has an enormous impact on our, uh, on the folks in motels, it, just like it impacts everyone else, right? 11 months of isolation, of displacement, of uh, uncertainty. I mean, these are layers of trauma and vicarious trauma on top of trauma. So I just, I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that we didn't, didn't leave this conversation without noting that. The third piece that I wanted to mention was that one of the incredibly valuable opportunities that we've seen come out of the pandemic response is the work of our community partners and the collaboration across different lanes, across different sectors to do what we can to help people uh, and to help keep people safe during the pandemic. Uh, if you ask, we had had a statewide summit back in November and that was the, the, one of the biggest themes that emerged from that conversation the ways in which collaborative partnerships have been critical in our response. And I really think that that's a source of optimism and a source for hope going forward. You know, there have been relationships that have been rekindled locally. There have been new relationships formed. There are ongoing partnerships across state government, and, uh, between state government and community partners. And I think that those pieces, that collaboration to provide the necessary supports and services to folks who need uh, assistance and are experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity is crucial. And that's, a, that, that's in part why going forward, we really feel it's imperative to build upon and to expand those relationships and those collaborative efforts. Because taking a, a multi-faceted approach to helping folks is a lot more effective than chopping it up into little pieces. 
and having a really disconnected uh, system of service. Which leads me to the, the last thing I wanted to mention, which is that um, we are indeed looking forward. Uh, we are looking forward to what happens after the, uh, the, the pandemic subsides. We're looking forward to what happens with the GA Motel voucher program going forward and the uh, department's emergency housing initiative, which um, the intent of is to, to shift from the historic system of care with the GA Motel voucher program to a community-based model of addressing a housing crisis. As a part of that initiative, um, next Tuesday, uh, Sarah Phillips of the Office of Economic Opportunity is hosting a webinar regarding uh, the department's emergency housing initiative. Uh, and that, uh, will, that's a statewide public conversation uh, to hear what the proposal is and also to walk through some of the mechanics uh, that we have laid out at this point. Uh, so we welcome folks to, to join that from all sectors uh, of, of our state. The other, uh, in addition to that, there were, there we're having local conversations, uh, conversations with the local continuum of, of care and other service providers to talk through, well, what does that mean? What does it look like to have a community-based model of emergency housing response? And I think that that's a really important place. We would welcome uh, public safety folks to be involved in that, as well as people from uh, our health providers, uh, social service agencies with lived experience. I mean, that, those are the tables at which there can be local conversations around what this, like how we collaborate, how we continue to collaborate and how we build upon the successes and the challenges we've seen. So with, with that, I'll leave it there. All right, thank you. Um, John, question before we get to Rick DeAngelis and to Barbara. Well, Trisha, I'm just wondering if, um, you, the those that broke the rules and had to be uh, moved out of the hotels, and you uh, did you say that they had to be out of the of the hotels for at least fifteen days before they could consider coming back in? Is that correct? Yes, that's right. If they're working with a case manager and it's a first offense, if you will, um, they could come back within seven days, seven days. and. Okay. They, um, we can rehouse them pending a fair hearing if they are asking for a fair hearing with the Human Services Board to review that period um, or that event that caused. Okay. Yeah. And do, do we have our hand, arms around how many people this ha had to be evicted over this? It's an ongoing, months? it's an ongoing list. Um, so it's current as people age off, if you will, their 30 days or 15 days expires, they're eligible again for housing. So at any given time, we have approximately 50 individuals on that list. And we just um, changed the rules so that the period of ineligibility does not, um, does not apply to adults with children, so families. Okay. And they can then be relocated to shelters or is that their responsibility to find their own way or what happens if, if I'm told I have to leave the hotel? It, um, they would not be eligible for emergency housing through economic services for the period of ineligibility. So if there were a shelter bed open, they would have been referred there in the beginning when we authorized them because we're a shelter first um, program anyway. So most of the time they would have to self-pay or find um, alternative housing during that period. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, we move now to Rick DeAngelis and to Barbara Jenny from the Good Samaritan Haven in Barry City. Welcome, Rick. Good to see you. Uh, great to see you all. I'm so delighted that uh, you're, you've uh, focused on this topic. Um, you know, it's it's been a hell of a year for all of us, for sure. And for our program, it has really been a hell of a year. Uh, and much of it has been centered around the motels in Washington County. And uh, I, my remarks are going to 
pretty much follow what I submitted to you, but I want to ch uh, chime in on that last question uh, about what happens to people if they're ineligible. Um, it does happen that occasionally we are still pro operating two shelters uh, right now, and it does happen that we have beds available from time to time, and uh, we do all that we can to, if we feel that somebody can be safely housed at our shelter, to get them into the shelter. And we also have a street outreach program uh, that we operate. And um, uh, if there is nothing else available, we, we will provide equipment and uh, some very, very basic support to, you know, to protect life. So I just wanted to address, uh, help address that question. So um, uh, yeah, so good to be here. Uh, good Samaritan Haven has been providing shelter for 35 years. And our, our main facility throughout most of those years is a very modest single family house in Barry. Uh, last year uh, in March, end of March, I will never forget that morning getting a call at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, we moved uh, over 60 of our guests uh, into area motels uh, in Washington County. Um, and since that time, we've had staff at the O'Connell Lodge, on-site staff, and at the Hilltop. Uh, now we are just solely um, site-based. Uh, we have an office at the Hilltop, which is the largest hotel in, uh, motel in Washington County. Uh, and we are providing outreach to all the, the all of the ESD motels. So it's uh, right now it's it's uh, well over 300 people that we're trying to provide some very very basic supports to. And um, if we have time uh, during the Q and A, uh, it was very interesting when we started at the O'Connell Lodge because there was a different model used there. The state was actually leasing the O'Connell Lodge. And I actually thought that that was the most effective setup that we had, but um, that is not the main thrust of my remarks. Um, so I do want to point out that we are part of a team. This is all about teams. And um, we call ourselves the Washington County Homelessness Action Team. And uh, I know that um, last week you heard from two of our very excellent leaders, uh, Eileen Peltier and Sue Minter. Uh, so we're part of that effort. So I am going to make three pretty high level points about what I think are the key ingredients or takeaways from this, this situation. Um, and I like to think of it not as security. I like to think of it as safety. It's a little bit broader. Um, yeah, you know, gee whiz, uh, I, I thought Jeffrey really hit the nail on the head. Uh, he, he said, this has been such a difficult, ambiguous situation. We don't know what's around the corner. And, um, and, and uh, we're in difficult settings. These motel rooms were not, motels were not made for this kind of long-term residency. And so many people, uh, you know, have experienced trauma in their life. So uh, obviously a very challenging situation. So it's no secret, you have to have a very broad and coordinated effort uh, to try to respond and, and support people. Uh, we work with a whole host of social service agencies, local officials, Montpelier, Berlin, and, and Barry. Uh, uh, also the uh, emergency uh, fire safety folks as well, ambulance, uh, they are a big part of the team. And, um, uh, you know, the state of Vermont agencies that come into play around this issue. Uh, we're always talking to the motel owners. They're obviously quite important. And we should not forget the guests themselves. Um, they are part of the solution here to make these places as safe as possible. And that's an important part of, of what we do is connect with them. So it's Obviously, it's no small order to uh, to coordinate all these different parties and players. And uh, in fact, it's extremely difficult. And uh, we've built what we have right now um, over time and incrementally. Um, and it hasn't been perfect, um, but uh, I actually feel pretty good about where we are in Washington County right now with the array of coordination. 
And I do want to thank uh, DCF. I think overall they have done a very good job. Uh, they have supported us as best they can. I mean, it's uncertain for them as well. And um, uh, we put out a lot of requests and overall I found them very, very responsive. So it's key that that responsiveness and the communication continues. And um, I have to say again on the ambiguity theme, I mean, my biggest fear right now is when are we gonna reach the cliff here? Um, what's gonna happen when uh, there's no longer any funding for our staffing or um, uh, we're phasing out the, the, the ESD vouchers for these folks? That is a real fear. And please, Jeffrey and Tricia and your team, do everything that you can to keep us in the loop on this early, early on, because uh, we're a small program and uh, even higher, you know, hiring, bringing on staff is very, very challenging. And uh, so that's my number one point. Uh, number two, I, you know, we have focused a lot about criminal misbehavior uh, and, and appropriately so. And we very much appreciate the involvement of, of the local uh, police community. Uh, security is important too. Uh, it plays a role. And we've also had the sheriffs involved with our motels. That's all good. Those are not the only safety issues. Uh, there's a big element of self-harm here. Uh, you know, uh, many people are struggling. Uh, may, a lot of those calls that the chief mentioned have to do with self-harm. Uh, people, uh, you know, harming themselves or drug overdoses or whatever. So that is a huge part of this uh, mental health and outreach, person-to-person -person outreach is so essential. Uh, and lastly, this is something that has not been talked about, but yet I think it's quite important. Uh, the There are some not good conditions in some of these motels. Uh, they were not meant uh, for this kind of um, habitation for such a long period of time. The hygiene is terrible in some places. They, you know, the motel owners, and I, in a sense, I don't blame them. They are not consistently cleaning these rooms. Um, we've had issues with black mold, sewage, uh, all kinds of things. And the only remedy right now is uh, a complaint-based system. And we do complain sometimes. I mean, we try to work with the owners, but if necessary, we will call up the appropriate officials. Uh, that is not a great system. And maybe I think we should explore if there are some other ways to get at this. Uh, my last point, and others have alluded to this, uh, we all know this is a stopgap stop measure. Uh, it was the right thing to do. Uh, there's no question about that, but we have to be looking ahead. And I'm gonna speak for Washington County right now. We have the second highest numbers in the state, and yet our infrastructure, our emergency housing infrastructure is inadequate. I can't believe it. Uh, and uh, um, that throughout this whole thing, uh, I have been trying to work on that, uh, that part of it too. And uh, so we are going to be looking to you for your support, for capital, and for operating funds so that we can, you know, have a better alternative to this. Um, uh, these folks are not all going to get into affordable housing in the short term. It is going to take a while. And uh, I have one more thing I'd like to say. Um, you know, I did the talking today, but... The real uh, champion here today is Barbara Je Jenny for my staff. I'm getting choked up. This is one of the heroes uh, from the pandemic. Um, this woman has been there. She has been doing it from day one. Uh, she has given it of herself uh, selflessly uh, to help people to be there for him, for them. And it is not easy. Just last week, she had somebody threaten her life. Uh, in uh, in one of, in the motel, so but she handled it as best she could and appropriately and gracefully. So I just want to I'm just so proud of my staff. So um, so I just want to recognize Barbara as part as part of my remarks today. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And 
Thank you, Barbara. Barbara, do you want to do you want to embarrass your boss any further? I couldn't do my job without Rick's support. I mean, Rick has been, I can call him on Sunday night at eight o'clock at night and, and we talk things over. I can call him at six o'clock in the morning and he's there. So I couldn't do this job without Rick, without Rick's support because he backs me a hundred percent. So thank you, Rick. Um, no, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, I think I think this conversation really shows the gamut, right, of what we're talking about when we talk about homelessness, and it's not even the full gamut. Um, it's hard to think about the difficult situations as, as illustrated by, by Tim Bombardier, you know, the, to, the, to the human issues that we just heard from, from both Jeffrey and Rick and Barbara, just that idea, and, and Trisha, just the idea of, Poverty isn't the crime here. That's right, Representative. I would I would just add that this is a population that is so um, preyed upon that some of the survival instincts and some of the choices they have to make are not choices we would make. Um, they're not mainstream um, and this is their very vulnerable population and we did do the right thing and we'll continue I think to work forward um, to make sure that there are more Rick's and Jenny's there uh, Barbara's to help people um, through this next phase and to honor and to honor the public safety aspect of it from you know from from their point of view too I mean it's the yeah, uh, you know, th this pandemic still exposes everything about everything. And it really shows us that we don't know everything we thought we knew uh, once upon a time. So, um, Representative Toronto, you had your hand up. Are you good? Yes, uh, I'm good. I just want to, I guess, one of the comments I would make is that. Um, um, in, in Trisha's uh, presentation, the amount of effort that went into um, this, uh, this, these concerns uh, really early on. I mean, last year we did hear about um, um, issues uh, surrounding security in there in the motel. And I guess the hilltop is what sticks in my mind uh, uh, as far as um, what we had heard about uh, issues there. But, you know, uh, the, uh, the expediency in which people were placed in these motels and, and uh, food was ordered up and they were fed and um, you know, it just, it doesn't surprise me that the chief got caught flat footed here, you know, um, and, you know, it just, it occurs to me, can we expect behavior changes when people are all now um, under incredible stress and um, living so close together? Uh, I guess that's the question that remains in my mind. Um, can we do it? Uh, is, is it possible? And that, I think, that's where the problem lies at, at this point. So, um, you know, kudos to everyone who has worked on this. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, great to hear uh, everyone's presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Representative Kalecki. Uh, Rick, th thank you. I, um, I live in South Burlington, so, you know, I see that in my county and in your county, there's, there's, there is coordination of services because of organizations like yours and all of the people. And I heard very clearly about the need for infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, next week, as we, we learned from when Jeffrey and Trisha talked about the webinar about this transition community-based model, it's going to be an interesting move for us in our state to do that. I mean, you, you've, you've shown us the greatness of it. Um, I guess I wonder about, um, and you may not have an answer for this, but how about the, the, the more rural parts of our state that are, don't have these kind of networks of support? Um, what's, what's the stories you've heard from those little towns that don't have the you and the Barbaras and the, 
you know, cornerstone. And I mean, what's happening in our state? Uh, well, I, we're pretty small too. We're not giant, but um, um, you know, I um, I keep in touch with my colleagues around the state that are providing these services. Yeah. And um, to to illustrate, I mean, it's the these some of these organizations are um, they are. Uh, uh, I'm trying to put this carefully. They're pretty fragile organizations because uh, they they have the challenge of working in lower densities. Uh, they're not they don't have as many people as they're serving. They can't afford as many staff and services. Um, you know, the funding piece is very challenging for a homeless organization. I, I have to raise a, a, over a third of my budget through private fundraising. Uh, and for us, that's about you know four hundred thousand dollars a year, and um, that is uh, it's a lot of work. And um, and uh, some you know some groups can do it, and and um, but it's it's challenging, especially for the, I think for the rural areas and the smaller organizations. Okay, well, thank you. And it just seems everyone is so afraid right now from all the heroic work you've all done. It's it's pretty mm -hmm. profound. So. Um, Bless you all for the work. Thank you. Jeffrey. Thank you. Um, Representative Kalaki, uh, something I might offer is that the summit that I referenced uh, from November, um, when we had over a hundred people on uh, from around the state on a uh, uh, Microsoft Teams meeting. Um, and that uh, we recorded that, and that is at the department's YouTube channel. Um, so. Uh, and the first part, of, I mentioned it because the first part of it was a report out from each community around the state on their experiences and their takeaways. Um, and I think that might answer a sliver of your question, uh, or at least give a, a broader overview. So I, I'd encourage you to perhaps check that out as well. Thank you. All right, I think I want to end it here by thanking each of you. Um, thank you, Rick. Um, and thank you, Barbara, for the work that you do at Good Sam. Um, it is really, uh, you know, that there are no good times for homelessness. So, you know, th this is a, you know, this period of time, I think as, as, as Rick, you mentioned, it's like, this is what we're doing today. And it doesn't address what should be done or what could be done or what we what we have discussed over the past decades of of dealing with the core issues of homelessness. But this is the reaction to what was in front of us. Um, and I think that I think that um, you know to to Chief Bombardier's concerns. Yeah, yeah getting caught flat-footed. I mean, I know that your work in Barry City is is very inclusive and in that you reach out to all of these different populations and service providers to keep a finger on it and to not criminalize behavior of people who are not as fortunate as, as we are. Um, and certainly Trisha and, and Jeffrey, the work that DCF is doing is really, um, it, it, it's just been, you've, you've had your fingers on the pulse in, in ways that I think you should recognize as being top notch and, and you know, really serves us all incredibly well. Um, committee, we're gonna take a break till 3.15.